And so today I'm continuing a series we've entitled The Parable Project. We've been looking at seven of the parables of Jesus. We know that parables were stories. Jesus often taught in stories. They were more memorable. It was his, his way of getting through to the Jewish people and, and, and speaking directly to their hearts. And so in this, we actually have been looking at some of the lesser known or more difficult parables to deal with. I actually ha had not heard or seen a lot of messages on several of these parables, and I've been enjoying digging into them. And with the size of our campuses coming together, we knew that we weren't going to be able to have elementary kids because we don't have enough kid space here um, with both campuses together. And so we got all the elementary kids in here with us. And I wasn't really thinking about the, the message we were coming to when we said, let's have all the elementary kids with us today. And so today, I am sharing a message with you entitled, Lessons from Hell. So let's welcome the kiddos here to Big Church. It's going down. Who's ready? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun. They got activity books, so for some of them that aren't ready for this, hopefully they're focused on that. Here we go. Uh, Luke chapter number 16. I'm going to be reading from there here in a moment. It will be on the screen for me in the back behind me. Um, this morning, Chrissy and I uh, were getting ready, and often we come separate to church. Uh, usually with kiddos, you know, we got three kiddos. You know the dynamic of trying to get them ready and get out the house. And also we have to be here early. We have a team rally 30 minutes ahead of time for anyone that serves in, uh, in that first service. And so we got to get here on time. And, um, you know, our kids often are running late and running behind. And my wife this morning, I was ready and nobody else was ready. And I said, hey, I'm leaving. And she was like, I don't want you to go. I want us to go together. And I was like, I hear you, but, like, I want to get there early. I want to make sure everything's good. This is a unique Sunday, and, uh, you know, I, I'm going to go. And she was like, I want us to go as a family. And I reminded her, you know, last week when you preached, you left early in the morning. Didn't even tell me. You just left. Then I got all three kids ready. And the week before that, you did the same. And uh, a couple weeks before, and it's pretty normal that whoever is speaking that day will just go ahead, and yet now you expect me to wait for you and the kids. I just don't understand. And she said, word for word, these were her words, Caleb, you will never understand women. I'm not exaggerating. These were her words. She can confess to this. Caleb, you will never understand women. And I was like, you're right, you're right. And it actually got me thinking about this morning because, man, we're coming to a, a parable that is a bit difficult, a bit challenging. And I think about how often people come to me and tell me, that I'm having a really hard time understanding the Bible, having a really under, a hard time understanding the Word of God. And, and as I thought about it, I thought about our marriage. You know, we have been married for 15 years now, just a couple weeks ago. And while I do not understand women fully, I'll tell you this much. I understand them a lot more 15 years later than I did when I first married her. And so this is just an encouragement to you today because some of you have a hard time. Man, I'm reading the Bible. I don't understand it. I, I, I'm trying to understand the scriptures and it, it's hard. I just want to tell you stay at it because the longer you're in it, the longer you dig into it, the more you're going to begin to understand it, and, and, and it's going to soak into your heart and spirit, and it's going to make more and more sense. So don't quit. Men of God, don't quit. We're going to understand these women more and more. Come on, woman of God. She'll tell you, I understand her more now than I did back then. So let me read Luke 16. Can I tell you, this is a terrifying parable. It truly is terrifying. This is the Jesus that not a lot of pastors love to preach or like to preach. It's the Jesus that not a lot of us like to even attach ourselves to. Because we like the grace-filled, mercy Jesus. But this is the savage Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, we just like to talk about the mercy-filled, grace-filled Jesus, but, but sometimes he, he was savage. And so this is one of those stories. 
I don't know if you're ready, but let's get ready. Here we go. Luke 16. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. Great word, sumptuously. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, this is hell, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. A parable, a teaching of Jesus that is often difficult for us to decipher, difficult for us to take in. And one that I think even in my readings I often just breeze over. Because when you dwell on it, it is very sobering. When you dwell on it, it is a bit terrifying. The word uh, used here for rich man is the word dives. This is a Latin word and it is referencing any rich person. And so today, I'm going to refer to him as that, Dives. So we have Dives and we have Lazarus. And I think the question that we all ask ourselves when we come to the scripture, if we really dig into it and look at it, is, which one am I? Am I Lazarus? Or am I Dives? And I want to say to you right now, that all depends. It depends on how you live. Some of us would say, well, it depends on whether I'm rich or poor, right? But no. This wasn't about what they had monetarily. This was about the posture of their heart. And we're going to dig into that. So what I want to talk to you about is I want to share a few lessons from hell with you. Are you with me? Lessons from hell. The first is that hell and heaven are real. I need to share this, which is crazy, in the church, but I think that there is a lot of misnomers and misconceptions theologically and scripturally, and I just need to remind you that Jesus actually talked about hell and Hades more than he talked about heaven, but he taught on them as real places, that eternity is real, and both of these places are where we will end up, one or the other. My son Canaan, uh, he, he just turned 12, and yesterday we were in the car, and he actually asked me what I was teaching on. And I told him, I said, man, it's going to be an intense one. And uh, the whole family was in the car, and I shared a little bit of what it was going to be about. And he said, Dad, here's what I think. I think there's a 90% chance that this Jesus thing, God thing is real. He's like, there's a 10% chance that it's not, and when we die, we'll just cease to exist. And I said, you know what, bro? I'll take those odds. I'm going to keep living my life as if the 90%, because if the 10% is real, what does it matter? But if the 90% is real, it matters greatly. And so while I don't get my instruction from a 12-year-old, I thought it was an interesting perspective. 
You see, I think there's this conception even as we, or misconception as we read this, that if you're rich, you go to hell. And if you're poor, you go to heaven. If you suffer on earth, you'll go to heaven. And if things are great for you on earth, you'll go to hell. That's not the point of Jesus' teaching here. Again, he is looking at their heart. And he's reminding us these are real places. Eternity is real. And eternity is long, church. And this is a warning for the Jewish people that they would look at their hearts and think about how they're living, what they're following. And it is just as true for us 2,000 years later as it was for them back then. The second lesson I see here is that bad things happen to all people. You know, I get a question a lot. Why does God, a loving God, a good God, allow bad things to happen to good people? And first of all, I have to kill that misconception because there are no good people. Scripture tells us there is no one good, no, not one. It's why we need the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins as we just sung. Because all of us are separated by a perfect God by the imperfections of our life. And you may be better if we were to gauge sins in this room as someone else in this room. But regardless of the atrocities or the greatness of your sin, all sin separates us from a perfect God. And so what happened is when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, Death entered the world. Destruction entered the world. And God said, I want them to be free will beings. And because of death and destruction and pain that entered the world through sin, and because of the pain that we inflict on one another, bad things do happen to all people. But you know what I found as I dug into this more? Is that while... Bad things happen to all people. Ultimately, God actually rewards us for our suffering here on earth. And this should encourage you because y'all been through some suffering. Some of you have been through the valley of the shadow of death even this year. Some of you have experienced death in your life, loss in your life, pain in your life, ongoing sickness in your life. And we see here that bad things happen to all people, but actually God rewards us through our earthly suffering. There are jewels that will be in our crown. He, he even brings this man, Lazarus, to a place of honor. This should encourage you today that you continue to be faithful in the midst of struggle and suffering and persecution and pain because God will actually reward you through it. Lazarus has some incurable disease. We don't know the nature of what it is, but we know that he's covered in sores. We know that he's satisfied with just the crumbs, the scraps from the rich man's table. And it's interesting to me, this is where we get to the heart of the matter, is that it says that the dogs came to lick his sores. And this seems foul and disgusting, but you got to understand that this actually soothed his pain. Now, some of y'all love dogs. Where are you at, my dog lovers? Come on, just, just say, that's me. I'm a dog lover, proud and loud. That ain't me. In fact, when I was 12 years old, my dad gave our dog away, took it to the pound. I know it's terrible. And for three days, me and my three siblings didn't even notice. His name was Best. His name was Buster from Animaniacs. Rest in peace. But it's interesting because while dogs are man's best friend, for many of us, especially in this culture, in this day, they were the lowest of the low of all scavengers. In Israel and Palestine... This region, dogs were not a pet. They were not man's friend. They were dirty, disgusting scavengers that lived off the trash. And yet this man, Lazarus, received more compassion 
from the dogs, from the lowest of the low, than he did from the rich man, Dives, who walked by him, it says, every single day. He hoped just for the scraps from the rich man's table. And every day it says that he walked by him and had no compassion on him. Bad things will happen to us. And I want you to hear me that God will reward us in heaven, in eternity, based on the suffering we experience on this earth if our hearts stay close to him. You see, Lazarus... His heart stayed close to God. He wouldn't have received this this promise and this place of honor if his heart hadn't stayed close to God. And here is Dives with all the opulence, clothed in fine linen, all the food, the, the, the extreme lavishness of riches. And his heart was dark. And so while he received on earth good, In eternity, he received the opposite. The third thing or lesson from hell that I see here is that death comes for us all. You know, I've really been faced with this lately because now in my early 40s, praise the Lord, I wake up every day with a new ache or pain in my body. This didn't happen in my 30s. It didn't happen in my 20s. But now every morning there's something else bothering me. My wife is like, Caleb, you need to stretch more. You need to drink more water. She's trying to help me out. But, man, I am faced with my own mortality every day as I age. Many of you can relate. Some of you are young in this place and you think, I'm never going to die. Can I tell you something? Death is the great leveler. No matter our position on earth, no matter how successful, successful, how well we do, how much riches we gather, uh, 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 properties we acquire, death comes for us all. Abraham's response to Dives is interesting here. You see, Dives, after walking by this poor man day after day, they both die, and one goes to the right hand of Abraham. And the other, Dives, goes to Hades to suffer an eternal punishment. And Dives actually cries out to Abraham. And he says, will you just have Lazarus dip his finger in water and just put a drop on my tongue to quench the fire that I'm experiencing? And Abraham's response is sobering. He says to him, it's too late. He says, it's too late. You had so much in this life, but now your roles are reversed. And it's too late. He says, there's a great divide, a chasm between heaven and hell. And this is something for us to acknowledge that only God could bring us to the place of eternal blessing. And if we end up in the place of eternal punishment, suffering, there is a divide that no one can cross. This should terrify us. That this is forever. And it's based on how we live our life right now. This story says there is no hope for Dives. There is none. And while we don't know if this is a true story or not, we know it's a parable of Jesus and he often made up stories, we do know that this same story has played out for all of human history with people that got the whole world but lost their soul. They gained the whole world but lost their heart. And so this should actually encourage you While sobering you, why? Because while there is no hope for Dives, there is hope for you and me. There is hope for you still today. There's breath in your lungs and ears to hear 
And there's a God crying out to you from eternity saying, I love you and I have a plan and a purpose for you. And it's life, not death. It's heaven, not hell. It's eternal promises, not punishment. So hear me, there is hope for you. And there's hope for me. I do think that suffering on earth will result in honor in heaven. And this should actually encourage us because some of us do suffer more than others. Some of us do experience more pain on this earth than others. And what does God do? He has Abraham, Father Abraham, the father of all the Jews. And they're listening to the story and they say this poor, wretched, sore covered Lowest of the low of society is at the right hand of our father, Abraham. A place of honor. He didn't get the bleacher seats, church. I see you in the back. You were late. But you're still in the room. I just want to say, when it comes to heaven, I'll be good with the bleacher seats. But hey, maybe today some of you need to hear that while you've experienced pain and suffering, there is honor and blessing coming to you in eternity, if not on this earth. If, if, not just if we're poor, not just if we suffer, but if we maintain a heart posture of humility and love for the God of the universe. See, it's not rich people that go to hell and poor people that go to heaven. It's not people who experience blessing on earth that go to hell. And, and people who experience nothing but suffering on earth that go to heaven. It's people whose heart stay postured in humility and love to their Savior. I've known a lot of rich people that love Jesus. And I know poor people that don't and curse his name. It's about our hearts. And yet there is an encouragement in this story towards us as followers of Christ. Towards what our heart posture should be towards those who do suffer. Who are the lowest of the low. The less than. That Christians, this is a lesson from Hell, that Christians should and must care for the poor. Watch this, Matthew 25. What does Jesus say about the poor? Matthew 25, throw it up for me. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him. Saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Christians, we must care for the poor. We must care for those who are in prison. We must care for those who are suffering, those who are naked. We must have a heart of compassion. And I got to be honest, I often don't. Like I live in Land Park and I drive five minutes to our church in Old Sack every single day. And every single day I pass encampments of homeless. And every single day I pass drug deals on the side of the road and every single day I'm dodging people next to the homeless encampments because they're just walking through the middle of the street and can I tell you what my usual natural knee-jerk reaction is as a man of God it's annoyance my usual natural natural knee-jerk reaction is somebody needs to get these people out of here they're infringing on my drive. It's terrible for me to look at. Now listen, we have a real problem in our, our state, our nation. We need to deal with it. We need to figure it out. We need systems and things in place. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about a heart of compassion for the poor, 
for the lowest, for the drug addicts, for the prisoners, for those suffering with addiction. And i got to be honest that I don't naturally feel that way. And so this week the Lord convicted me because he said, this is a lesson from hell, Caleb. That you as a follower of Christ, not as a pastor, not as a leader, but as a follower of Christ would have compassion for the poor. Because my heart breaks for all people. And so my prayer for us as a church is that we would begin to see with spiritual eyes. We would begin to pray when we pass them, not respond with annoyance verbally. We would begin to stop if God tells us and commands us to in love. But you know, that's not always what we can do or should do or is safe to do even. And so my encouragement to you is that you would continue to give through your church. And listen, I I understand the challenge of giving to the church. I mean, some of you are very cynical and critical, like me. That's my natural bent. And you go, oh, I know when I give, it's going to pay for this building and that building over there. And yeah, you're right. And I know that it's actually going to some of Caleb's salary. And yeah, you're right. This is my full-time job. But also, I want to tell you that we take... What you give and we give it away. Last year we gave over $100,000, $120,000 to ministries and missionaries all around the world. Last year we gave over $40,000 to Convoy of Hope who are feeding over 500,000 children every single day. Why were we able to do that? Because you give through the church. And it's why I always encourage people, we can do more together. I understand the cynicism and the criticism, but I just want to tell you, we are doing our best with our board. I don't make the financial decisions on my own. Our board advises us that we would be good stewards of what God gives us. We would continue to steward well the facilities we've been given and the leaders we've been given, but ultimately that we would also release compassion into the world, and we do it. And so I know that we can't help everyone. But we can be obedient to where God's placed us and where God's called us. And I believe he wants you to give through this church to further his kingdom. And another lesson from hell, if the keys would come back, is that repentance must be the response. We must respond in repentance. I thought it was significant that the rich man, Dives, doesn't cry out to God. He doesn't cry out to Yahweh. Who does he cry out to? He cries out to Abraham, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus and just give me a drop of water. He didn't cry out for a second chance. He didn't cry out that God would hear him and, and respond to him. And I think that we have to understand that even in it all, he didn't repent. Even in the midst of his suffering, he still doesn't repent. God, I'm sorry for how I was. I'm sorry for how I lived. I'm sorry for my selfishness. No, he just says, can you just help quench what I'm experiencing? And I've had people say to me, well, shouldn't God give people another chance? Like after this life. And listen, we don't have everything when it comes to scripture of what's going to happen in eternity. But what we do have says, we have a chance here on earth. And every day we have a second chance, and a fifth chance, and a hundredth chance. And even all of creation cries out that there's a creator. And so our posture must be repentance. And I don't want you to hear this message and be like, man, I better repent out of attrition. I talked about it two weeks ago. What's attrition? It's where you repent to avoid punishment. It's where my kids say they're sorry because they got caught and they don't want to get whooped. We need a repentance of contrition. Where our heart is broken that we've broken God's heart. Attrition leads to true salvation. 
contrition never lasts. So I want to say it again to you. There's no hope for Dives. There was no hope as Jesus told the story for Dives. But there's still hope for us. My last lesson I see from hell is that our heart should break for anyone that doesn't know the truth. Our heart should break. It should be broken for anyone that doesn't know the truth. How selfish of us to have the truth and know the truth and carry the truth and only keep it to ourselves. And I get it. They'll criticize me. They'll mock me. They'll call me a Jesus freak. They'll say I'm closed-minded. That I lack love. That I'm judgmental. But I would present to you that there is nothing more loving than sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That I once was lost but now I'm found and you too can be found. This last week I played basketball on Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. at 24 hour. And a couple guys from church coordinated it and we went out there and you know I'm not as good as I used to be church. It's okay though. You never lose your jumper. And I'm out there, and we're hooping at the end. I'd never been out there in the morning with them. And this guy had coordinated. He actually had invited some of his coworkers who weren't Christians. And there were some guys from church that were there. And at the end of it, he gathered everyone together. He's like, hey, guys, come over here. And he's like, hey, I want to pray over the needs in this group. And I'm like, oh, snap. You go, okay. And he starts taking prayer requests. And then there's one guy we don't know shooting on the other end of the court. And one of the guys with us is like, hey, bro, come down here. So he comes over. He's like, oh, you guys need one? They're like, nah, we're about to pray. Do you have any prayer requests? And I'm like, yo, what are y'all doing? Okay. And this guy's like, yeah, actually, I do need prayer. He shared a couple requests, and they prayed over all the needs there. And I just looked, and I said, man, that is the heart that the church must have, that there are people that we are in proximity to every single day that maybe don't know the truth that we carry. Our heart should break when anyone doesn't know the truth. You see, Jesus tells this story because his heart breaks for the people. And he actually says it's something significant at the end of this. That Divy says, okay, well, send a dead person to tell my brothers at least. Because I don't want them to experience the same suffering that I'm experiencing. And Abraham responds to him. He says, they have the prophets, they have Moses. What's he saying? He's saying they have the word. He's saying they have the word already. They, know, they have the word. And Divy says, no, 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 listen, I, I know they have that, but if you send a dead person, send a ghost, not the Holy Ghost, just a ghost, to talk to them, then maybe it'll save them. In the story, Jesus speaks and he says, if they don't believe in the word, they won't believe if I raise someone from the dead and send them. You see, Jesus is actually prophesying about himself. He's prophesying that I will die and rise again and still they'll deny me. Still they'll say I'm not their Messiah. Still they'll say I'm not the Savior. And yet, the lesson from hell here is that our heart should break for anyone that doesn't know the truth. So I want to say to you, the material things will fade away. But the riches of heaven and eternity endure forever. And the good news, some of you are like, is there any good news today, Caleb? Here's the good news. You're going to be selfish. And you're going to get annoyed with the poor. And you're sometimes going to think only about yourself. 
And you're sometimes going to have opportunities to share the good news and you won't out of fear. The good news is this, is that the blood of Jesus Christ covers our failures and the blood of Jesus Christ covers our sin. And even when we fall short, if we continue to repent and say, God, I can't do this without you, we will receive eternity and an eternal promise. So there's good news today, church. But in a room this size, I know that there's some of you that if you were honest, you'd say, Caleb, my faith has not been what it should be. I've been running from God. I've turned my back on God. I've lived a life of lavishness and selfishness. But today I'm done playing games. Today I decide I don't want to be divies. I want to be Lazarus, not because of what they experienced, but because of the posture of their heart. So with heads bowed and eyes closed across this room, if that's you, you say, Caleb, I need to repent. I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to invite Jesus into my heart for the first time. I need to recommit myself to him anew and afresh. I want you to lift your hand right now if that's you. Go on, shoot it up and put it down. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I see hands going up all around the room. Just real quick, up, down. I see him, I see him, I see him, I see him all around the room. Good, good, good. Come on, pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I need you to forgive me and to change me and make me new. I ask for forgiveness for my selfishness, my pride, my self-focus. And I invite you to be the Lord of my life. Change me. Make me new. Today, I give all that I am to you, Jesus. In your name.